Good morning. Notwithstanding what it may say in the program, I am not now nor have I ever been Alan M. Rock QC or the treasurer of the Law Society of Upper Canada. I am Paul Lamick and I'm the chairman of the Legal Education Committee of the Law Society. Even as we speak, the treasurer is wallowing in the flesh pots of Paris and could not be persuaded to come back to open the special lecture series this, week, this year. But on behalf of the, the Law Society, I'm very pleased indeed to welcome you to the opening session of the 1992 Special Lectures. As many of you know, the Law Society has been holding these lectures since 1950 and always here at Osgoode Hall, where the, as I understand it, the longest running, and I think by any assessment, the preeminent continuing series of legal education in the province and in the country. And I'm particularly delighted with the response to this year's program. Even in recessionary times, we have an, an enrollment, a registration, approaching 250, which I think speaks well of the, the design of the program and the work of the planning committee. Now, a, a key feature of the Law Society's special lectures has always been to maintain a continuum of educational excellence for the benefit of the practicing bar in this province in the context of the public interest, and we're seeking to do that again, of course, this year through a special lectures. And no one can doubt, I suggest, the, the timeliness and appro or appropriateness of the topic this year. As practicing lawyers, it's often very difficult for us to raise our heads from the work that we have at hand in order to take a long view of developments in the law. And this lecture series provides us with an opportunity to do just that it's a very valuable opportunity indeed, given the, the gravity and the seriousness of the issues with which are currently dealing and which, with which we'll be dealing over the coming years representing clients. I want to express the thanks of the society to those who've been responsible for the development and presentation of the lecture series. First, of course, Philip Annesman and Dennis O'Connor QC, the co-chairs of the program. Their planning committee, Professor Hudson Janish of the University of Toronto, the Honourable Mr. Justice Horace Creever of the Ontario Court of Appeal, Sidney Lederman QC of the Steichman Elliott firm, and the ubiquitous and tireless David W. Scott QC of Scott and Aylin in Ottawa. And also, of course, I want to express our thanks, the Society's thanks, and I'm sure yours, to all the other members of the faculty for this program. A very distinguished faculty has been assembled. They've responded with the, the eagerness with which organizers of these programs through years have become accustomed, to which have become accustomed, and they've had the responsibility of preparing the materials and the remarks presented here. Finally, let me thank the members of the Law Society's legal education staff, the Director of Continuing Legal Education, Brenda Duncan, and her staff for their involvement and very hard work in helping to put this program together. I know that you will have an interesting and indeed a stimulating program over the coming two days. It only remains for me to go away and turn this podium over to Phil Annesman so that you can get to the business at hand. Philip. Thanks, Paul. Now, I think he's gone, but thanks, Paul, in any event. Um, I'll be uh, chairing most of today's session along with Hudson Janish. Um, I can only echo uh, Paul's sentiments. I'm not Alan Rock either, in case you hadn't noticed. And, and also, I'd like to thank uh, all of the planning committee for their work. Uh, what I'm here to do immediately is to introduce our keynote speaker. As you all know, our keynote speaker is the Honorable Mr. Justice uh, Gerald Laferre of the Supreme Court of Canada. Um, I'll just tell you a few of the uh, of bits of, of information of his uh, quite uh, remarkable background. He's, he's had a, a, an illustrious career, I'd say. He obtained his law degree from the University of New Brunswick. He went on to, be, to Oxford as a Rhodes Scholar, where he obtained a BA and an MA. He later went to Yale University, where he obtained an LLM and JSD degree. 
Uh, he practiced law in a variety of capacities. He's been a corporate house counsel, a federal government lawyer. Uh, he was a professor of law. I treat that as a form of practice of law. Uh, at, at the University of New Brunswick, the University of Alberta, and the University of Ottawa. He was also the dean of the law school at the University of Alberta. Uh, when I first met him, he was a member of the Law Reform Commission of Canada, where uh, as a commissioner, he assumed responsibility for the Law Reform Commission's administrative law project. He's the author of a large number of books and articles, a fellow of the Royal Society of Canada, and the World Academy of Art and Science. Uh, he was first appointed to the New Brunswick Court of Appeal in 1981, and subsequently to the Supreme Court of Canada in 1985, where he's played uh, what I'd say is an especially important role in the areas of relating to public law, constitutional and administrative law. I'm very pleased uh, to be able to introduce uh, Mr. Justice Laferre to you today as our keynote speaker. Well, unlike the previous speakers, I can't, after this introduction, disclaim that I'm somebody else. Um, thank you very much, Phil. Uh, let me say, first of all, how happy I am to be in Toronto and to be associated uh, in some way with these lectures that I have very much uh, admired for their quality and their utility. In, many walks, in the many walks of the legal profession that I have uh, adopted. Now, the importance of administrative bodies in contemporary Canadian society can hardly be overstated. Today, of course, much of our daily business is regulated by government. Included are a vast array of activities ranging from communications to financial markets to human rights and labor, to name a few. A number of diverse governmental structures have been created in consequence from planning boards to, uh, to welfare tribunals to transport commissions. The increasing scope and degree of state involvement in societal affairs has posed problems for established legal systems, and particularly the courts. While the institutions and, and uh, agencies of the state must be given sufficient room to accomplish their tasks effectively and efficiently, they must also be accountable for excesses or abuses of power. Appeal tribunals are obvious response to the issues of fairness, as are political appeals on policy issues. Still, the legal profession, at least rhetorically, continues to focus on judicial review. And this despite the uh, fact that the effectiveness of judicial review as a means of controlling the administrative process may well be overdrawn. To begin with, the tools the courts have traditionally used to supervise the actions of administrative authorities, the prerogative writs and other extraordinary remedies, are fraught with difficulties that can impede proper review. In Ontario, this has been corrected to a considerable extent, but there's still room, I think, for the broad type of consolidation proposed by the Law Reform Commission some 15 years ago. A second problem, is that if the decisions of administrative bodies were to be reviewed in all but a very small number of cases, the courts would become overloaded and the administrative process would become seriously impeded. Finally, administrative authorities generally have greater competence and expertise in the complex matters assigned to them than the courts. In its working paper on the federal court, the Law Reform Commission, of which I was a member, stated that the question of administrative justice should be faced primarily at the agency level. I haven't changed my mind. 
That having been said, there is still an important role for the courts in the administrative process. Judicial review has immense symbolic value as an expression of the rule of law. Moreover, by the creation of core principles and acceptable standards, the courts play an important educational and leadership role. And it can never be forgotten that the review of administrative action by the courts may be the last or only resort for those who have been unjustly treated. In sum, there is a legitimate role for the courts in superintending the administrative process. Our ongoing task is to more fully define the appropriate dividing line between matters of public administration and matters that are properly the concern of the courts. In the time remaining at my disposal, I'd like to focus <coughs> more directly on three areas of concern that have recently received attention from the Supreme Court. The principle of curial deference, the content of procedural fairness in the context of administrative tribunals, and the jurisdiction of administrative bodies to determine the constitutional validity of their enabling statutes. Turning first to the principle of curial deference, the courts have been struggling for some time to determine the degree to which it is appropriate to review the decision of administrative bodies. This has proven to be a particularly thorny issue. Views range from two polar extremes. On the one hand, there's the view that administrative agencies have been specifically created and designed to achieve distinct objectives and that the courts should leave them to implement their decisions and to bear responsibility for them. At the other extreme, there are those who emphasize the historical and constitutional function of the courts to supervise the institutions of government and to maintain the rule of law. This presupposes a more activist stance by the courts. In truth, there is an inevitable tension between the claims of fairness and efficiency. And that tension is reflected in different ways in the different ways in which individual judges approach different factual situations even when they purpose to apply the same standard of review. Despite that, it's fair to say that since QP, the court has adopted an approach of curial deference. It has shown considerable reluctance to interfere with the decisions of specialized tribunals. In, uh, in QP, Dixon J. held that if a specialized tribunal decides a matter within its jurisdiction, the court should only intervene if the tribunal's interpretation of its enabling legislation is so patently unreasonable that its construction cannot be rationally supported by the legislation and thus, thus demands intervention by the courts. He also noted that the empowering statute at issue in CUPE contained a privative, privative clause which protected the decisions of the board made within jurisdiction. This constituted a clear statutory direction that the courts were to exercise restraint. In, in Pakar, another case involving a specialized tribunal protected by a privative clause, I adopted the principles in CUPE and stated that in such circumstance the court will only review a decision of the tribunal if that tribunal has either made an error in interpreting the provisions conferring jurisdiction on it or has exceeded its jurisdiction by making a patently unreasonable error of law in the performance of its functions. In the latter category of error, the test for judicial review is a severe one. A tribunal may make errors, even serious errors, as long as it does not act in a patently unreasonable manner. I noted that mere disagreement with the result arrived at by that tribunal does not make that result patently unreasonable. And that the emphasis should not be so much on what 
result the tribunal has arrived at, but on how it arrived at the result. Mr. Justice Sopinka, in that case, however, expressed the view that when a court says a decision is unreasonable, it is making a statement about its merits, and that curial deference does not enter the picture until the court disagrees with the tribunal. The two approaches of the majority in Pakar are arguably radically different. Uh, <coughs> are not radically different. But at least one commentator has suggested the possibility that Mr. Justice Sopinka's approach may open the way to si significant judicial intervention. The same commentator adds that the dissenting judgments of Madam Justice Wilson and Lerdo Dubé attacked the tribunal's decision on policy grounds. The same possibility is seen in the different approaches of Mr. Justice Gontier for the majority and Madam Justice Wilson for the major minority in the National Corn Growers Association case, where it has been argued the majority departed from the CUPE test. Still, Mr. Justice Gontier stated that the courts in the presence of a privative clause will only interfere with the findings of a specialized tribunal where it is found that the decision of the tribunal cannot be sustained on any reasonable interpretation of the facts or of the law. This sounds a lot like vintage CUPE, and it's possible that the difference between the majority and the minority flows from different perceptions of what that ru the rule in QP is. Still, commentators have detected other straws in the wind in other cases. Now, needless to say, I leave to others to say whether the foregoing cases reveal some efforts at fine tuning or the effect on individual judges of the tension between the demands of fairness and, and efficiency in the light of specific facts. What is clear is that despite variance in the manner in which the different judges in our courts express the tests, the courts in this, or the court in these cases ended up by exercising restraint. There's been some fine tuning regarding situations where there is no privity clause. In the recent Bell Canada case, Mr. Justice Gontier for the court stressed that the decision of an administrative tribunal are only entitled to a non-discretionary form of deference if the legislator has ex clearly expressed its intention to protect such decisions through a privative clause. However, he went on to say that even in, in the context where there is no privative clauses, consideration must be given to the principle of specialization of duties. He held that although an appeal tribunal has the right to disagree with the lower tribunal on issues that fall within the scope of statutory appeal, curial deference should be given to the opinion of the lower tribunal on issues which fall squarely within its area of expertise. Similarly, in Zurich Insurance, Mr. Justice Sopinka expressed the view that curial deference will normally apply to findings of fact, even in cases where there is no privative clause. He added, however, that such deference will apply, not apply to findings of law which the administrative body has no particular expertise on. It's not difficult, I think, to understand, as I mentioned before, the rationale for judicial restraint in the re review of administrative decisions. Courts are often not as well equipped to it as administrative agencies to deal with the complex issues that come before agencies. Special knowledge, sensitivity, and expertise are frequently required to properly resolve the real life disputes that arise in the administration of regulatory programs. It may be that more refinement is needed regarding the type and scope of e agency expertise to which the courts should properly defer. 
Dean Wade McLaughlin, for example, has suggested that the key to curial deference lies not in a re reformulation or a reiteration of the policy of judicial restraint, but in a shift of the debate more squarely to the how, to the who of interpretation. In short, he suggests that judicial review should involve a more complete assessment of the expertise and the capacity of administrative decision makers. In his words, courts must justify their interventions in terms of deficiencies in the personnel or the process under review. The second concern I'd like to address is the adequacy of administrative procedure. In assessing this matter, we must, of course, keep in mind that the functions of many administrative authorities are not of a court-like character. Consequently, a ri rigid judicial model of decision-making may be highly inappropriate, uh, inappropriate for administrative agencies. A flexible standard of fairness and natural justice must be applied to fit the needs and functions of the particular body at issue. This issue, issue recently arose in Consolidated Bathurst Packaging Limited, where the court was concerned with the propriety of the Ontario Labor Relations Board's practice of calling a meeting of the full board to discuss the draft decision of a three-person panel at its request when a major policy issue arose. The parties were neither notified of nor invited to participate in this meeting. The full board limited its discussion to the policy implications of the decision. No vote was taken or consensus arrived at. No minutes were kept and no attendance was recorded. Consolidated Bathurst argued that this practice breached the audio alterum partem rule, but the court rejected this argument. Mr. Justice Gontier for the majority first observed that a tribunal's institutional constraints have to be taken into account. These tribunals, he said, are created to increase the efficiency of the administration of justice and are often called upon to handle heavy caseloads. He said it would be unrealistic to expect them to abide strictly by the rules applicable to courts of law. The institutionalized consultation procedures here, given the importance of the policy issues at stake and the necessity of maintaining a high degree of quality and coherence in the decisions of administrative agencies, were acceptable. Mr. Justice Gontier, however, set forth certain guidelines including the following. First, the board must not compromise any panel member's capacity to decide the matter as he or she saw, saw it. Second, the members of the, of the panel who actually participate in the decision must have heard all the evidence and the arguments. Third, a full board meeting must not be imposed on the panel members. Fourth, the parties must be informed of any new policy or argument on which they have not made any representations and must be given a reasonable opportunity to respond. And fifth, factual issues must not be discussed at full board meetings. In that case, the guidelines were met, so the impugned board meeting did not violate the principles of natural justice. Rather, the procedure was a practical means for the board to take advantage of the accumulated knowledge and expertise of, of its members when making important policy decisions, thereby improving the overall quality and consistency of its decisions. Tremblay versus Quebec Commission des Affaires Sociales provides an interesting contract, contrast. I shall not res repeat the facts. There was a preliminary <coughs> meeting here. They were optional in theory. In practice, the meetings were compulsory when legal counsel for the board 
determined that the proposed decisions of the original decision makers, and the only decision makers, was contrary to previous decisions. The evidence there depicted a system in which the decision makers were constrained rather than simply influenced by the consultation process. Additionally, a number of points in the rules for holding plenary meetings, when taken together, created the potential for an appearance of bias and lack of independence. For example, a plenary meeting could be requested not only by the quorum responsible for making the decision, but also by the president of the commission. There was a vote by a show of hands, generally speaking, and as well as attendance. And minutes of the plenary meetings were kept. These decisions indicate that a certain latitude will be given to the internal consultation process of administrative bodies. It is not mandatory that the full procedural rules of courts apply. We must be mindful of the fact that some decisions involve policy considerations that transcend the concerns of the particular parties directly affected by the decision. And we must also be careful to ensure that administrative bodies are not unduly fettered in their work by unworkable rules. However, there are limits to this procedural flexibility. Although consistent and coherent decision-making is an important objective in administrative law, the procedures invoked to promote collegiality should not impinge upon the ability of the decision-makers to decide as they see fit, nor should they create an appearance of bias or lack of independence in the minds of the litigants. While there's clearly a need for the development of procedural norms suited to administrative agencies, the procedures devised must maintain a proper balance between fairness and efficiency. I turn then to the third concern that has recently emerged in our court. That is, the extent to which administrative bodies are entitled to make decisions under the Charter. In Cuddy Chicks, the court was asked to consider whether the Ontario Labor Relations Board had jurisdiction to subject its, <coughs> I'm sorry, to, was asked to consider whether the Ontario Labor Relations Board had jurisdiction to subject its enabling statute to charter scrutiny in the course of its proceedings. The court concluded that it did. Of particular significance in this case was the fact that the board had jurisdiction under its enabling legislation to decide questions of law relevant to the proceedings before it. I confirm the basic principles articulated in Douglas Qualton Faculty Association versus Douglas College, that an administrative tribunal which has conferred the power to interpret law holds a concomitant power to determine whether that law is constitutionally valid. The rationale for this conclusion flows from the principle of constitutional supremacy found in Section 52.1 of the Constitution Act, 1982. I was careful to note, however, that Section 52.1 does not itself confer jurisdiction to consider and rule on constitutional issues. Therefore, before a tribunal can address a charter issue, it must already have jurisdiction over the whole of the matter before it, namely the parties, the subject matter, and the remedies sought. In other words, the relevant inquiry is whether the legislature intended to confer on the tribunal the power to interpret and apply the charter. I held that in this particular case, the legislature Later, had, did have such an intention since the board's enabling legislation expressly conferred authority on the board to decide questions of law. The real difficulty, of course, arises when the legislature has not given any specific indication that the body concerned may decide questions of law. This issue arose in Tetro Gaduri. 
That case involved a 65-year-old woman who applied for unemployment insurance benefits. She would have been entitled, were it not for a provision in the Unemployment Insurance Act, which prohibited the dispensation of ordinary benefits to applicants over 65. The Commission ruled accordingly, holding that she was only entitled to a special lump sum retirement benefit amounting to three weeks of benefits. She appealed to the Board of Referees on the ground that the relevant provision of the Act was inconsistent with the Charter. The Board upheld the Commission's decision without rendering an opinion on the constitutional question. Rather than appealing to an um umpire, as permitted by the Act, she challenged the Board's direction directly in the, at the, federal court of, in the Federal Court of Appeal. The Court of Appeal found that the Act violated Section 15 of the Charter and that the Board had erred in failing to consider the Charter arguments. In our court, we had to determine the pre preliminary question of whether the board had jurisdiction to consider a challenge to the constitutional validity of the section of the Unemployment Insurance Act. The decision reveals the factors courts will take into account in deciding whether a tribunal has such jurisdiction. The nature of the task and the quality of the decision maker has to be borne in mind. And this seems to relate back a bit to curial deference. Thus, the court noted that those who made the initial determinations regarding eligibility, monetary entitlement, benefit periods, and compliance with the Act had no jurisdiction to entertain charter challenges. I noted that the careful consideration essential to undertaking an adequate assessment of the constitutionally of the constitutional issue is fundamentally at odds with the speedy procedure required to allow the Commission to fulfill the functions it was designed to perform. But the Court will also look for indicia within the statute itself. While it was arguable here that the Board of Referees had the necessary expertise and practical capability to do so, such jurisdiction was expressly conferred upon the umpire, a judge of the federal court, leading to the conclusion that the legislature intended that the umpire and not the board be given the power to consider and decide constitutional questions. The point I wish to emphasize here is that to a certain extent, the charter has broadened the powers of administrative tribunals. It is clear that the Charter has added a new dimension to the Canadian legal system by according rights to individuals against legislative enactments that did not exist before. As I noted in Douglas College, one of the practical advantages in allowing a party to challenge the constitutionality of a statute before an administrative body is the relative accessibility of such bodies as compared with the regular court system. Citizens may assert their constitutional rights without having first to resort to the courts which are often more expensive and time consuming. I also noted in Cuddy Chicks that the ability of an expert tribunal to analyze competing policy concerns within a particular regulatory context, to sift the facts and to compile a cogent record for the benefit of, of a reviewing court is of great value in the resolution of constitutional issues. However, despite these practical advantages, the le legislature must be given latitude to determine which administrative body should be given jurisdiction to decide constitutional issues in the course of proceedings before them. To the extent that the legislature has chosen to restrict an agency's ability to decide questions of law, the courts must respect that limitation. At all events, at the end of the day, charter issues are ultimately for the courts to determine. So the jurisdiction of administrative tribunals is limited in at least two respects. First, they can expect no curial deference with respect to charter decisions. And second, a formal declaration of invalidity is not a remedy available to tribunals. 
In other words, an impugned provision may only be considered invalid for the purposes of deciding the question before the tribunal. Now these seem to me to be among the principal administrative law issues raised before the Supreme Court in recent years, and I've only sketched them out. I look forward to examining the more detailed commentaries in the lectures to follow. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Justice Laferre. Uh, I think we should move now to our next speaker, uh, Margot Priest. And let me just get her summary. I shouldn't need the summary. I've known Margot for some time. She was among the students in the first class I taught at Osgood uh, about a few years ago, let's put it, put it that way. Uh, let me tell you the way we're going to run the rest of the program. Uh, as you know from the program, there are speakers and commentators. What we'll attempt to do is uh, allow each speaker a half an hour to present uh, a summary or overview of uh, their views as expressed in the paper. Uh, you've got copies of drafts of the paper and Every registrant will be getting the revised drafts of the paper in the annual book that's published for the special lectures. The commentators will then be given 10 to 15 minutes each to comment on the, uh, on the presentation of the speaker, uh, after which the speaker will be given 5 to 10 minutes to respond, and then we'll open the matter up for questions. Uh, as you can see from the program, we have a, a fairly tight timetable. And I'll attempt to uh, keep speakers and commentators within the time limits I've just described. Uh, so if I appear to be rude, uh, you'll understand why when I, I pass notes. Um, this brings me to um, our next um, paper, which is on the structure and accountability of administrative agencies. The speaker is Margot Priest. Uh, Margot attended Harvard University for her undergraduate education and obtained her LLB at Osgoode Hall Law School. After graduating from law school, I should say since graduating from law school, Margot has, had, has developed a, a broad background uh, in terms of her career in, in government and government positions with respect to uh, regulatory issues in both the federal and provincial governments. She was a consultant to the regulation reference of the Economic Council of Canada in the late 70s. Uh, she was employed as a member of the staff of the House of Commons Special Committee on Regulatory Reform in 1980, and she worked in the Office of the Coordinator of Regulatory Reform in the federal government for the following few years. Subsequently, um, she's held a number of other positions, of course, in the federal government, as you'll see if you read the CV and the materials. So, since then, she, she has been the vice chairman or vice chairperson of the Ontario Highway Transport Board, and she is currently the chairman of the Ontario Telephone Service Commission, a position which she assumed in July of 1989. <coughs> uh, excuse me, I'm just trying to get over a cold here. I shouldn't let these personal things get in the way, but they seem to. Um, She's a member of not only the Ontario uh, Law Society, the Law Society of Upper Canada, but also of the, the Bar of California. She's chair of the Council of Canadian Administrative Tribunals and a member of the Communications Committee of the National Association of Regulatory Utility Commissions. I think she's eminently qualified to talk to you about the structure and accountability of administrative tribunals. And I'll turn the podium over to Margot. Good morning. Now, I want to talk today about the structure and accountability of administrative tribunals. 
but I do not intend to produce a treatise for you. Have I got this in the right place, or does it sort of echo? Does it work? Okay. A treatise for you on the best organization and structure for the delivery of administrative justice. Nor am I going to provide a list of recommendations to improve the current system. This work has been done. In fact, it has been done many times in many jurisdictions, and a number of the people in this room have done some of the work. You can choose your own recommendations from the hundreds that are available that have been done over the past 15, 20 years. There are certainly enough to go around. In fact, there's probably enough for one recommendation for everybody in this audience, but some of you may think that you're sharing because many of the recommendations are very similar. But instead, what I want to do today is identify some questions that need to be answered before any serious reform is possible. There are underlying issues that we and governments have been avoiding. I will be looking principally at appointments, the training of members, the relationship of the agencies to the administrative branch of government and political control. But before we look at these, I think we need to take a quick look at the problem. Why are there so many studies and recommendations? I would like to introduce you to the tribunal from hell. All the problems exist in this one unhappy organization. Let's imagine a tribunal. Let's suppose it's fairly small. Perhaps a dozen members who make the decisions in the matters that are brought before them. And in fact, that is their job, to make decisions. They are assisted by a small staff, secretaries, clerks, and perhaps even a few people with some specialized knowledge who assess the cases before they are heard by the members. Most tribunals, by the way, do not have any specialized staff of this sort. Now, this tribunal may be small, but it's quite visible. You've read about it in the newspaper. Its decisions affect the lives of many citizens. Perhaps it determines whether a waste disposal site will be built in your neighborhood, or how much you will pay for your phones, or whether you're entitled to a pension or other social benefit, or whether you can even live in Canada. Some people say that the decisions of this tribunal and others like it affect the lives of citizens more than the decisions of the courts, or more than most of the decisions of the courts. Larger numbers of Canadians are likely to be in contact with these administrative tribunals than will appear before the courts. The administrative justice system, in fact, has been described as, quote, the face of government, unquote. But the members who make the decisions in the tribunal change every three years. They are not required to have any special training or background. Now, this is particularly unfortunate because there's no training available to them. They are not chosen on merit, and many have no idea what their job will be before they accept it. The full-time members of this tribunal do not receive any monetary recognition for exceptionally well-done work, or for long hours, or for travel. Their salaries are compared to the public service. Last year, many of them got pay raises equal to public servants who have been rated unsatisfactory in their job performance. On the other hand, some receive no raises at all. Their pensions are often not portable and are not worth a great deal after three years. Interestingly enough, the senior public servants who are also appointed may receive extra pension credits because of their own potentially short terms of service. And although the members are only there for three years, they cannot actively seek new jobs while working for the tribunal. There are some jobs they cannot even take until after a year or six months when they've left the tribunal. Unfortunately, the salary and benefit package does not compensate for the difficult transition to a new position. The chair is held publicly, publicly responsible for the decisions of the tribunal but she has very little say in who becomes a member. She may first hear of a new member when he shows up in the office, or she may read about it in the newspaper. There are no rules or procedures for a chair to follow in disciplining a member. In fact, there are some questions as to whether she even has the power. And there is no procedure for a member to follow who feels that he has been treated unfairly by the chair. 
Neither the chair nor the members can ensure that a disinterested and knowledgeable body can investigate problems and complaints. The chair may have little or no opportunity to request, defend, or explain resource requirements, which are determined by public servants. There have been cases where a ministry will not even tell the chair what the budget is. The ministry may also be responsible for administrative support, such as paying bills, ordering supplies, or hiring staff. But they may give a very low priority to this tribunal's needs. The chair, however, is held publicly responsible and accountable for any delays or poor service due to underfunding or poor support. Now, this tribunal makes decisions, but sometimes the minister, who has a lot of power over membership, salary levels and resources, gets to argue what the decision should be. In fact, sometimes the minister gets a second chance to make the decision, or maybe a group of ministers get to redo the decision, but no one knows exactly what they do when they do that. Sometimes a court redoes the decision, but the tribunal cannot tell the court about its background expertise in its specialized area. Now, each characteristic of this tribunal from hell applies to some agency or tribunal. Every tribunal has at least a few. Each example is drawn from a real situation, although perhaps I should issue a disclaimer and say that my own tribunal accounts for only a few of the examples. But this is hardly a structure that any sane organizational behavior expert would deliberately sit down and create. The reason it works at all is that a number of people show goodwill and common sense and have a genuine desire to serve the public. Nonetheless, problems occur often enough that it, it has been the subject of extensive examination over the years. Now, I mean it when I say the examination has been extensive. If you include studies done in the United States, Great Britain, and Australia, as well as those done in the various Canadian jurisdictions, they total in the, in the dozens. There really are enough recommendations to go around. In my paper, I've provided more background on these studies, and I have deliberately given fairly detailed footnotes. I thought it might be useful to you to have an easy source of reference. But preparing this paper was a very interesting exercise. It was the first time I had sat down and reviewed the studies all at once, one after the other. And the most striking thing is how similar they are. In looking at the broad issue of reform to the administrative justice system, the points of agreement are much more common than the disagreements. In Canada, for example, in the last 30 years, there have been two federal royal commissions that examined administrative tribunals. Then the regulation reference to the Economic Council of Canada studied the roles and responsibilities of economic regulatory tribunals. And the Law Reform Commission of Canada published a series of studies of individual tribunals and of other issues relevant to administrative law. The Special Parliamentary Committee on Regulatory Reform made recommendations on the federal economic regulatory tribunals. The Standing Joint Committee on Regulations and Other Statutory Instruments made a number of reports throughout the 70s and 80s dealing with procedures. The Privy Council Office Review Group on Regulatory Reform examined many of these recommendations in order to provide a government response. In the context of the general examination of government activity done by the Nielsen Task Force on Program Review, two studies were done, one of regulatory programs and one of regulatory agencies. Then the Canadian Bar Association did another study on the independence of federal administrative tribunals and agencies, the Ratushny Report. The Ratushny Report was then referred to the Federal Minister of Justice by the CBA. And the Minister, the Honourable Kim Campbell, has said that reforms to the administrative justice system are one of her main priorities. And the Department has three related projects going in this area. Now those are just the highlights from the federal side. In Ontario, we have the McCrewer Report that set the tone for the public policy debate on administrative tribunals for many years. Uh, 
Some would argue that the report was responsible for an overly judicialized approach to administrative justice that avoids flexibility and experimentation. We had the Management Board Agency Review Committee, which studied the classification of various agencies, boards, and commissions, or ABCs as they're known in Ontario. A hierarchy based on financial reliance on the Consolidated Revenue Fund and the necessary degree of direct government control was then instituted. The Standing Committee on the Legislative Assembly and the Ontario branch of the Canadian Bar Association studied the appointment process about five years ago. Many of the recommendations of the Standing Committee can be found in the current government's process for approving appointments. The Ontario Law Reform Commission considered an administrative justice project in 1988 and proposed a study on, on enhancing the quality of performance of tribunals. The Commission did not complete its project, presumably because the Management Board had requested Mr. Robert Macaulay to review many of the same issues. The Macaulay report was prepared in response to request to do a, quote, in-depth review of the ABCs to support the objectives of ensuring efficient, <coughs> effective service delivery in government." Unquote. The report made a number of recommendations, many of them dealing with amendments to the Statutory Powers Procedures Act, Procedure Act and the establishment of a council for administrative agencies. The Macaulay Report has stimulated additional studies. The Ministry of the Attorney General is examining amendments to the SPPA. The Management Board Secretariat has been carrying out an agency program review with several task forces which are looking at procedural reform, the role and function of adjudicators, new regulatory adjudicative models, the restructuring of administrative services and a cost recovery and fees policy. In other Canadian jurisdictions, the Working Group on Administrative Tribunals in Quebec issued its report, known as the Willette Report, in 1987. The Willette Group, in turn, had reviewed a number of studies that had previously been done in Quebec. Legislation has been proposed in Quebec, although not introduced, uh, at least the last I heard, and that would implement many of the recommendations of the Willette Report. New Brunswick, Nova Scotia, and Alberta are all examining the creation or revision of Administrative Procedures Acts. Most of these task forces, working groups, and commissions have also examined a number of reports from foreign jurisdictions. The Franks Report in the UK, the Care Report in Australia, and the Landis Report, the Ash Council Report, and the American Bar Association Report in the United States, just to name a few of them. All in all, the literature is formidable. And as I said, the striking thing about the documents is how similar they are. They all refer to the problems found in the Tribunal from Hell. Poor quality appointments, a mysterious and closed appointment process, lack of training for members, the uncertainty of tenure and other problems with terms and conditions of office, poorly defined relationships with government, the difficulty of defining the need for or the meaning of independence, the inappropriate relationships between tribunal members and the executive, both the political and the bureaucratic, and various problems with procedures or delivery of services. There's a general agreement on either the reality or potentiality of these problems. There's also a surprising degree of agreement on possible solutions. They all agree on high quality appointments of people with the necessary skills and temperament to perform the job well. They are sensitive to ensuring that appointments represent men and women of different regions, cultures, minorities, skills, and points of view. While political affiliation should not disqualify anyone from appointment, it should not be an important criterion. Appointments should be for a sufficient length of time for members to learn the job and contribute to the tribunal. Adequate notice of reappointment is a necessity. Most of the studies, however, do not address the problems of remuneration and pension. There are also common themes on improving the appointment process. Job descriptions, a job bank or list of qualified candidates, and consultation with the chair and client groups. 
Occasionally, the reports recommend a public review process, usually by a legislative committee. All but the Privy Council Office Review Group agree that members require training, both in the substantive matters relating to their specific tribunal and in general administrative law and procedures. There is also general agreement that some sort of organizing body or council to carry out various functions would be useful. The exact role of the council varies, but common tasks are training and developing conflict, conflict of interest guidelines or model procedural codes for tribunals. Some suggest that a council might even deal with complaints or undertake some of the more in-depth investigations now carried out by royal commissions or ad hoc task forces. Most of the studies recommend that reviews or appeals to cabinet be eliminated. It is interesting but not surprising to note that cabinet reviews are favored only in the studies done by the politicians, such as a special parliamentary <coughs> committee, or by the specific bureaucrats who control the review process, such as the Privy Council Office Task Force. Several studies suggest that the political review power be replaced by a power to issue binding policy directives. However, the politicians and bureaucrats who like cabinet appeals also want to have the policy directives. And while the studies vary on whether a general administrative procedures act should be passed, most agree that the tribunals should have rules of procedure that are publicly available. Now, with recommendation after recommendation available to governments, and with such agreement on both the problems and the potential solutions, what has happened in this area in the past few years? Now, the short answer is not much. Some governments have a public list of order and council positions. In Ontario, certain nominations are reviewed by the Standing Committee on Government Agencies. Oral commitments have been made to provide adequate notice on reappointment. Sometimes the commitments are even cut. The tribunal members are organizing training and educational conferences, usually without any help from government. Informal in-house training is common, and the Ontario agencies have formed the Society of Ontario Adjudicators and Regulators, which has the sort of lovely acronym of SOAR and are holding their fourth annual educational conference at the end of this month. The Council of Canadian Administrative Tribunals, or CCAT, has, has been established by federal, provincial, and territorial tribunals. It organizes an annual three-day conference, it publishes a newsletter called the Tribune, and it sponsors the publication of the Canadian Journal of Administrative Law and Practice. It also regularly presents briefs on policy and legislative proposals to various jurisdictions and coordinates consultation between governments and members of the quasi-judicial community. CCAT has incorporated a National Institute for Administrative Tribunals, which is modeled on the National Judicial Institute. Its mandate is to design, organize, and deliver training programs for tribunal members generally or on request for for specific tribunals. There are other organizations made up of tribunals dealing in special subject areas, public utility regulation, workers' compensation, securities regulation, and liquor licensing, for example. These also provide opportunities for tribunal members to learn about special areas or discuss common problems. Now, these efforts and reforms are not trivial or they're futile but they are fairly minor in comparison to the general body of suggested reforms. Many are carried out by the tribunal members themselves, with little or no institutional encouragement from either government or the legal community generally. And on one level, I'm proud of the work that we, and I'm speaking here as a member of a quasi-judicial tribunal, have done. At another level, I have to ask why institutions that are called, quote, the face of government, unquote, and that affect the lives of so many Canadians should receive so little attention when it comes to taking action and making changes. Most of the proposals and recommendations for reform of the administrative justice system 
have accepted the underlying structure of the tribunals. There has been discussion of their anomalous status in a parliamentary system of responsible government. There has been concern about unelected persons making important decisions. There have been discussions of accountability. Nonetheless, their benefits have been recognized. Agencies legitimize decisions that would be too politicized if made within the bureaucracy or by cabinet. They permit the public examination of issues and decisions. They allow due process to be applied to decisions that are too numerous or too narrow to be assigned to the courts. They permit the multi-expert examination of polycentric issues that are ill-suited to the court process. And they allow the public development of incremental policy in areas for which standard government policy development procedures are inappropriate. However, inconsistencies in policy and structure have increased as the institutions have developed. Although the specialized tribunal is not as modern a creature as many would believe, some do date from the turn of the century or the post-World War I era. And these were usually formed as a direct substitute for political control of decisions by cabinet or the legislature. Now, when these agencies were established, decisions by cabinet were truly decisions of individual ministers with some assistance from advisors. The smaller size of government personalized decisions and ministerial responsibility. A disinterested public process that insulated the politicians from controversy was the benefit of these new agencies. It is not surprising, however, that the ministers who gave up personal power to the new agencies wished to maintain some control in the form of appointments or reviews of decisions. The social regulatory agencies dealing with benefits or tort substitutes were usually developed later as deliberate alternatives to the court system. Mass adjudication, lower costs, easier access, flexible or more informal procedures, and an opportunity to develop consistent case law reflecting broad social values were the benefits of these agencies. But their structures were essentially similar to that of the economic regulators. Appointments remained a political prerogative. Although the social regulators' decisions were seldom subject to review by cabinet, there was often a new form of political involvement. The minister is the party to the proceedings. Some of the newest agencies are dealing with newly created rights or polycentric decisions that are considered difficult to make in the adversarial environment of the courts. Nonetheless, it is believed that these decisions should be made in a disinterested public forum. They often reflect the interests of a number of departments or ministries and require the application of a variety of expertise. They may be controversial and require depoliticization for legitimacy. The public may want to be involved. Some of the environmental assessment and development decisions often would fall into this category. Appointments here are also made politically, and a number of ministers may be parties before these agencies. As the new agencies are created, and as more citizens are affected by agency decisions, the structure developed in the 19th century continues to be applied. Most of the recommendations and studies accept this essential structure, and consequently fail to address some basic questions. <coughs> The first question is, can we continue to accept political patronage as the basis of membership to agencies and tribunals? For hundreds of years, the business of government was conducted through patronage. Eventually, the concept of a professional and disinterested class of civil servants, civil servants evolved. Appointment by merit was accepted federally in 1917. Now, the ideal may be occasionally compromised, but the general principle has led to a structure of job descriptions, selection criteria, and competitions with some form of due process. Now, you may say that I'm naive to even raise this question. That may be. But a number of the other problems associated with the tribunal from hell, the questions of terms of office, remuneration, pensions, inadequate training, are related to this first issue. 
As long as the appointments are viewed as access to the pork barrel, then the members won't have the respect that will lead to investment in their training or to improve benefits and conditions of employment. And I believe it's important that we begin to talk about this. Does it make sense that the decision makers in an institution affecting so many people, an institution that is the face of government to most Canadians, should be chosen on grounds other than their capacity to do their job well? It's one of the basic questions. The next question, why should these members of agencies, who are considered to be the keystone of the administrative justice system, be subject to an ad hoc arrangement of salaries, benefits, per diems, and general terms and conditions of employment. Why should tribunal members, unlike other Crown employees, be told that their remuneration must, and this is a quote, reflect an element of public service, unquote. Why have so few studies recognized the role of budgets and resources in determining the degree to which actual decisions or the capacity to make decisions can be controlled politically or bureaucratically. In asking these questions, I do appreciate that the public sector must not lead, lead the private sector in wages, and that tribunals as public bodies must be subject to the same financial accountability and audit controls as the rest of government. I believe that the effect of the current situation on the quality of administrative justice needs to be discussed openly, however. This may be more rather than less important now that governments are financially constrained. Another question is why should nearly all the training provided to tribunal members be programs that they have organized themselves, either in-house or as a group? The value of job training is well known. This should not be politically controversial. Of all the recommendations made by the many studies, the need for training has been the most common and widely accepted. Most governments provide training programs for their civil service. Some are quite <coughs> elaborate. The federal government has just increased the standard executive training program from two weeks to four weeks. It's a residential program, by the way. Yet, with the exception of Quebec, no government has organized or funded training for tribunal members. Even when the money was available in the 80s, the big years, the infrastructure for training was not established. And I think the answer to that particular question might provide some hints on why some of the more difficult reforms were never implemented. And then, with all the genuine problems that the tribunal from hell can have, one might ask why so much time and energy is spent discussing the problems of a lack of accountability. Because tribunals operate outside the usual hierarchy of departments or ministries, some people view them as being unaccountable. When the studies are viewed in quick succession, the overall impression is that the agencies might be a country bumpkin relative who's going to do something awkward at the family reunion. But at the more emotional, and as opposed to the analytical level, this concern might be based on some of the other anomalies, the potential for members who are chosen on criteria other than competence <coughs> and their lack of training to do something that's embarrassing. But the structure and process of agencies do not reveal an organization that is inherently unaccountable. Agencies operate in public, with public decisions made by identifiable individuals and usually accompanied by reasons. Their decisions are based on known and public information. Their procedures are governed by fairness or natural justice. And I might add that to the extent that the Charter is emphasizing due process values in our society, the legitimacy of the open decision making of tribunals may be enhanced. The tribunals are responsible to the legislature or parliament and they report annu annually, and they are subject to audits. As creatures who derive their power from the legislature, their mandate can be changed and their existence can be terminated. Accountability, among other things, relates to being able to identify what a decision is, who made it, why it was made, who influenced it, and who will be affected by it. 
On these points, tribunals are accountable. In fact, they are among the most responsible and accountable actors in government today. And although I did promise that I would, be not, I would not be making more recommendations, I do want to add a few suggestions to the debate. One of the reasons the administrative justice system was developed was to depoliticize decision making. It is now time to look for ways to depoliticize the system itself by seeking nonpartisan methods of filling positions on tribunals and agencies. It must be publicly recognized as unseemly to have an institution that affects large numbers of citizens in fundamental ways used to pay off the favors of political campaigns. The studies examining the independence of tribunals from political interference usually discuss the so-called midnight phone calls. They seldom discuss the effects of gratitude. Depoliticizing the administrative justice system must also mean that the jobs are established as positions that qualified people would want. The job must be worth the personal commitment of people to be trained and to dedicate sufficient time to repay the investment in their recruitment and training. I would suggest the term of three years is too short. Perhaps seven to ten years might be more realistic. I also believe that private sector contracts can teach us something about how to look at questions of tenure and the perceived independence of members. It is not necessary to have a guarantee of tenure until retirement to ensure psychological independence. What is important, however, is having other forms of certainty about financial arrangements, financial security, and stability. A long-term contract that provides for a transition period and realistic severance benefits at the end of a term that both parties know will arrive at a particular time would provide such certainty. Pension arrangements and severance should recognize the limited period of the contract. Transition arrangements should recognize that certain jobs are not available to the member, or at least not immediately. And although there may be opportunity costs for public appointments, I don't believe that people should actually be penalized for taking them. Contracts can provide for earlier terminations if government priorities change. I think many of the awkward exits of disaffected tribunal members could have been prevented if a more businesslike attitude had been taken to the matter by both parties, both the individual and the government. Some of the difficulties with budget and fiscal control of agencies in Ontario could be reduced if the agencies were able to deal more directly with these matters, as is done in the federal jurisdiction. However, the independence suggested in this area is not independence from central agency reporting or audit standards or legislative control. The open processes and transparent decision making should be seen as the primary source of day-to-day -day accountability of the agencies. Enhancing such openness is not, quote, judicializing the system, but it encourages its legitimacy. Improving the capacities and resources of the agencies will allow them to improve in these areas as well. Trained decision makers able to write clear reasons, improved case management and data collection techniques to make information available, and more accessible procedures or public knowledge about mandates and process lead to accountability. It is a happy coincidence that improvements in the quality of appointments and in training will likely lead to more transparent decisions and processes that will themselves improve accountability. There has been a great deal of time, effort, resources, and intellectual energy spent on the examination of the structure and accountability of agencies or tribunals. The similarities of the recommendations are more striking than the differences. A consensus on both the problems and solutions is remarkable. A more practical yet fundamental approach, however, may be required and some very fundamental questions answered in order to achieve the result of a stable administrative justice system with the status and integrity it deserves and requires to carry out its functions. Okay, how do you do?